Hi, this is Deval Patrick, former governor of Massachusetts, and I've got a podcast. We call it Being American. In each episode, we talk about the major challenges that people and families and communities all over the country are facing that need real solutions and how a better understanding of our shared values and objectives can help us bridge the kinds of differences that keep us from those solutions. I interview political figures, elected officials, grassroots organizers, regular citizens, folks in and out of politics and civic life who are in search like me of common wisdom in these uncommon times. Join us and help bridge the divide. It's the Being American podcast, which you can subscribe to or download wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to For All, a podcast by ACLU of Mississippi, offering lessons and stories on how to advocate for all Mississippians. I'm Candace Coleman, the Communications Director at ACLU of Mississippi, and this week we are continuing our conversation about Black representation in the legislature. But first, a quick history lesson. The 1965 Voting Rights Act removed many of the Jim Crow barriers that prevented Black Mississippians from registering to vote and accessing the polls. By 1967, still in the glow of the Voting Rights Act, 28% of Mississippi's registered voters were black. As black voter representation accelerated, there was a hope that black legislators would be elected in several Mississippi counties with majority black populations. However, when Robert Clark was elected to the Mississippi House of Representatives in 1968, he became the first African American seated in the state's legislature since the end of Reconstruction. For eight whole years, Clark sat alone as the only black legislator in Mississippi's capital. While other Mississippi lawmakers had at least one, if not multiple, desk mates, Clark labored from a small workstation, literally isolated from his colleagues and struggling to even be recognized to speak during debate on the House floor. It wasn't until 1976 when another African-American joined Clark at the Capitol. A full decade after the Voting Rights Act, only four of the 174 Mississippi legislators were black. At the time, Mississippi used multiple member districts and gerrymandering to cancel out the strength of black voters. And the practice of black vote dilution, unfortunately, is not a thing of the past. After asserting their rights under the Voting Rights Act, civil rights attorneys and black leaders, they came together to challenge Mississippi's racially discriminatory redistricting process. And it took a 14-year legal struggle and a court order redistricting plan before Mississippi's black population would finally begin to have a voice in the makeup of the state legislature. And finally, in 1979, Robert Clark was joined by 16 newly elected black Mississippi senators and state representatives. And today you'll hear from one of them, former District 38 representative Tyrone Ellis, who is one of very few black legislators to ever serve on the redistricting committee. You had a lot of experience in at the Capitol, nearly 40 decades, uh, not 40 decades, nearly four decades, nearly 40 years. Uh, you're gonna, how, <laughs> how old are you going to make me, Kansas, man? <laughs> I mean, I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> nearly four decades, 40 years okay, in, right, the, in the right. legislature <laughs> um, <laughs> you spent and you definitely, you, you left your mark there. Can you tell me about one of those moments where the Black Caucus had to come together and really, really just give it their all? And you all were able to pull through, but if you all had more votes, if there was more Black representation, it, it might not have been as much of a hill to climb. There were occasions where we had to 
do what we call pull the nuclear option. Now, nuclear option is, is somewhat referred to as if you're going to hit that button and send the nuclear bomb toward the enemy. So you say nuclear option, and you know that's the last straw, right? Our nuclear option in, in the legislative process, in the House anyway, was the reading of the bills, demanding that the bills be read. And our proudest moment is when we first started exercising that. And we did that when uh, they refused to do Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King's make it a holiday when everybody else in the country had agreed to it. And uh, I remember correctly, if I'm not mistaken, Ed Perry was the speaker or the acting speaker one during that time. And he, he defied us every turn we made about not adhering to accepting the bill. And he was telling the, his leadership, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do it. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, it was a gentleman from Greenville, Mr. Uh, the Honorable Leslie King, Supreme Court Justice, I believe he was the first one to, to say, have to read the bill, Mr. Speaker. And when he said that, it started a firestorm and we would all get up one behind the other so it wouldn't be on that one person. We all got up one behind the other, read the bill, Mr. Speaker. And it is a constitutional provision. And the reason that constitutional provision exists is because there were members in the legislature that could not read, Candace, could not read. And therefore the constitution required that they would they could require to have the bill read in order that they would understand what was in the bill. As irony would have it, that particular provision came back to become a tool of ours. One of the first things I, I want to make sure that we that we talk about is your time on the redistricting committee and being one of the only black legislators to be on that committee, it's gonna always be disproportionate, obviously. But what was it like being on the redistricting committee when you were on it? And what were some of the struggles that you had to overcome trying to, to make sure that those maps were equal for black voters? Well, frankly speaking, it was the same struggles that we have today with blacks being the only ones on certain committees. There's not a whole lot of difference in that. In answer to your question, what it was like, <laughs> it was like having to go out and fight a war all by yourself <laughs> with a little ammunition. You know, you, you get out there and, you know, and, and you had to fight the fight, but you didn't have any bullets. You had guns, but you didn't have any bullets to put in the gun. And uh, Ed Blackman was a formidable uh, force on the committee always. A quick note here, Edward Blackman is still on the redistricting committee. The long version of that is the Mississippi Joint Legislative Redistricting Committee. But Blackman, who represents District 57 in Madison County, is one of only four black legislators currently on the 20-member committee. The other three are Bo Brown, a Hines County representative, Derek Simmons, who is a Mississippi Delta senator, and Sheck Taylor, who took over Representative Ellis's district in Lowndes, Octibaha, and Clay counties. All right, back to the conversation. And of course, the caucus. He's referring to the Black Caucus, which is just a formal name for the group of lawmakers who are Black. We would meet late hours at night, as I foretold you earlier, and try to figure out, we, we would have to do our homework at night in order to be prepared for them the next day during the real meeting. That's something that a lot of advocates talk about is how there are already maps being made. There's already conversations that are already happening before the actual session begins. And oh, yeah. the need for some transparency and for us to see those maps once they are completed before they go to a vote. What did transparency look like back then, and how can we make transparency better? There was no transparency back then. And number two, there is no transparency today. <laughs> they're not going to let you see. They're already having the backdoor meetings, backroom meetings right now. They're having them. They've already been in process. They started working on this last year. 
I'm sure, if not but sooner. And so what you all had to do when you were on the committee, you all had to be ready for those uh, maps, those back, those back door maps that have already been made. You all had to be prepared to, to come with something to, to battle against them, right? Yes, you had to have something to counter that. If they were to come with a proposal to say that we're going to take District 38 and we're going to make it 51% African-American Black voting, age, we would have to have a, a plan to show that we could take District 38 and we could comprise it of a 52% or 53% Black voting age. We would have to prove how we could do it and why we needed to do it. When early on, but whether I was on the committee or not, I would engage myself, as would some of the other caucus members, in making sure that we would burn the midnight oil, stay up, work with those who were on the committee. And then when the committee did meet, we would pack the rooms out to make sure that our voices were heard. And we talked a little bit about the struggle that also happens when we have these packed districts and we need legislators to give up some of their, some of their votes. <laughs> Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, that stands true today, and for what reason, I don't know. When you have a district like District 38 up here with a 51 or 52 percent, 53 percent probably now at the most African-American Black voting age, and then you have packed districts with 85 and 90 percent, 80 and 85 percent minimum in some of the Delta districts and some of the Jackson area districts, I mean, that's really... That's uncalled for because what it does, it, it takes away. And even in our congressional districts, we have to look at it from a standpoint of, can we do better? Can we get at least one other African-American congressman out of the congressional districts that we have now? And I think we can. And when we talk about congressional districts, in the last census, the last redistricting, we ended up losing a congressional seat. How did that negatively impact Mississippi? Very much so, because we had a shot at getting another African-American congressman when we had the five districts, because we could kind of work around that and muscle our way into a few more votes. But now with four districts, that's very difficult to do. And, and of course, it's based all on population. And I don't see us with any population gain. So we're doing well to try to hold on to what we have. It's sort of like a cycle when you think about it. You know, it starts with redistricting and making sure that everybody has um, equal representation across the board. And if we were to have that equal representation across the board, then maybe we can get some things passed that are actually in the best interest of uh, black Mississippians and, and not even just black Mississippians, but most Mississippians or Mississippians as a whole then that would in turn, you know, possibly keep keep some population here and stop the flight right. of the, right. the brain drain. And then we could keep the population and then we mm -hmm. can get the seats that we need. You know, it's kind of, it's a it's kinda, Yeah. It's kind of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg, you know. If we had more African-American districts, we could do more for the state of Mississippi as a whole and in particular to the African-American community. But on the other hand, the white majority feels like, well, no, we don't need to have, we don't need to lose any, any of our white majority seats. We'll represent the people in the African-American community just the way we are, or the people of color just the way we are. That's basically their take on it. So how do we show up for each other? That's the question we try to answer each episode. As former Representative Tyrone Ellis stated, the issues that we face in order to make Mississippi more equitable can all be traced back to redistricting. It's basically the foundation of this house we call Mississippi. And the way to make our house more sturdy is to start with pressuring the redistricting committee to draw district lines and create fair maps and to be transparent about that process. 
And how do you pressure them? You start by visiting ACLUMS.org or click on the link in the episode description. It'll take you directly to our redistricting webpage where you can view frequently asked questions, talking points, and the full list of the Mississippi Joint Legislative Redistricting Committee, including their emails. Email committee members and ask them to hold a public hearing so we can see these maps before they're voted on. Because without transparency, we the people are left in the dark. Thanks again to former Representative Tyrone Ellis for joining me on For All the Podcast. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at ACLU underscore MS and find us on Facebook at ACLU of Mississippi. All right, now go advocate for something. <laughs>